Video games have always been a part of my life, from playing Asteroids very badly at the Montem Sports Centre when I could barely reach the controls, to playing Elite on my BBC Model B with my friend Michael Hall after school. I've always loved them. Today, the video game business is bigger than Hollywood, worth some $20 billion a year. So where did video games come from? And how did they manage to take over the world? How did we get to this? <laughs> from this. Computers have been around for a good 20 years before anyone discovered what they'd really been put on the earth to do. Play games. These prehistoric blips represent mankind's first attempts at creating computer games. Bouncing balls appear to have been popular with the programmers. The world's first fully evolved game wouldn't appear until... 1961. America elected its youngest ever president, John F. Kennedy, amid the swirling skirts of rock and roll, the hula hoop and the chill of the Cold War. Computers were the size of small houses, but cost a lot more. These massive mainframes went for hundreds of thousands of dollars, even then, millions today. Used by lab-coated university scientists and military boffins as expensive calculators, they were only meant to do big sums for serious people. However, in the autumn of 1961, when the Digital Equipment Corporation delivered this machine, its dinky PDP-1, they had high hopes that the eggheads at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology would come up with something revolutionary for it to do. One young man, Steve Russell, a 24-year-old engineer, did. However, it wasn't quite what they'd imagined. He invented this, Space War. In the early 60s, America was obsessed with space exploration. Computers were playing a vital role in the race to beat Russia to the moon, so it's hardly surprising that the world's very first computer game put university nerds at the thrusters of their very own spaceship. People didn't appreciate what maneuvering a spaceship in space is like, and so I wanted to make it realistic. Space War was a two-player game. The aim was to destroy your opponent before he, and of course it always was a he, destroyed you. An idea which has been used once or twice since then. Having spent most of my life playing video games, I was about to play the man who's to blame for me not being a successful neurosurgeon. OK, Steve, here we are by a PDP-1, which Space War was written on. We can't get it to work, but 38 years later, we've got an emulator off the internet of your game, so it would look something like that, basically. Yeah. Do you want to have a, a quick game of this? Sure. I'll show you how to play computer games properly. Oh. <laughs> Let's just see. OK. OK. OK, here we go. Uh... Oh, you got a lucky one. Oh, well, but you got me anyway. <laughs> when was the last time you played this? Do you remember? Uh, oh, about ten years ago, I guess. Oh, really? Something I've, like uh, that. I've never played it. I'm beating you 3-0. Hmm. When you, pl you played it on the PDP-1 originally, what were the controls like? Did you have uh, joysticks or keyboard? Or? <laughs> these switches. So, imagine that these four switches are the same as the four keys you were using. Rotate ca counterclockwise, rotate clockwise, fire the rocket, fire your torpedo. And, and if you're in really desperate straits, go into hyperspace by doing rotate left and rotate right bit, together. a bit risky doing the hyperspace. Now, this you'll is... notice that your elbows are resting on a very hard surface or possibly on an angle. Yeah, exactly. It's quite uncomfortable. Yes. Well, very quickly, we got a solution to that. It turns out the PDP-1 could have special purpose hardware wired into it. Oh, really? And so one of the first things that happened was everybody made buttons. <laughs> so they were like the first sort of joy pads that you get now? Yeah. They, they were just four buttons. All oh, right. You would prepare this, the programs on paper tape like this. Right. Where, where would this be kept in the machine? Is there a sort of section where it was hidden away? Or? Well, um, so you, frequently there was a thing taped onto the console or a loose container. There might be something in here. Wow, look at that. Yeah, this is the sort of container. And this is Space War <gasps> That's your, from your the... Uh, digital Equipment Users Group. So th this is what you actually wrote? 
Uh, yeah, and this is what uh, got distributed with every with PDP ones after a while. Oh, really? They, they, they gave it away free, did they? With the, oh, with yeah. The machine. See, that's like when the, when you buy a Nintendo now, they give you a GoldenEye with it or Mario sixty four or something. It's the mm -hmm. same sort of yeah, sort yeah. of thing. A slightly higher premium. Yeah, it's slightly. When did you realise? Was there at some point in the sixties or seventies you went? Hang on a minute, that was my idea. I started that. Well, not, it wasn't exactly like that. I was working at Stanford. One night, we went out to the Oasis, uh, the, the nearest bar, and uh, they had a pinball machine, and there were a bunch of Stanford students uh, playing the pinball machines. And after they closed and threw us out, I went back to pick up some stuff, and lo and behold, there were a couple of guys who were playing pinball at the Oasis who were back playing uh, <laughs> Space War on the PDP-1. And I said, Oh, it's really a substitute for a pinball machine. <laughs> so Space War was all very well and good, but it can only be played by about 2,000 beardy students across various university campuses in the US. It needed two things. Firstly, the technology had to become much, much cheaper. No one's going to pay half a million dollars just to play a game. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it needed a visionary. Someone who recognised the potential appeal of these computer-generated line drawings to people other than those messing about in the lab after hours. It would take 10 years, but in the summer of 1972, that man appeared. His name was Nolan Bushnell, and his company, Atari. We hired our friends, and we uh, hired our, our friends' friends. And, and it was, uh, I can remember when we wanted to put in such things as health coverage, uh, health insurance, for a company, when they did a, a quote, uh, for us, they couldn't believe it because our average age was like five years younger than the youngest average age company that they'd ever done. And as a result, we had fantastic rates. <laughs> Bushnell was a video engineer with a vision. He happened to have spent his university holidays working in a pinball arcade. He realized if you put a video screen in a wooden box, you could make a video game. In 1971, he knocked up the world's first video arcade cabinet in his daughter's bedroom, Computer Space. Quite frankly, it was a little bit ahead of its time. Uh, the public wasn't quite ready for it. All my friends liked it. All my friends were engineers. Engineers may have liked it, but most of the 1,500 machines produced were installed in bars where, despite its amazing looks, computer space's fatal flaw was exposed. It was too complicated to play if you were drunk. Atari comes from the Japanese word uh, from go was where I had been acquainted with it, and which was equivalent to check or guarde uh, as a polite warning to your opponent that uh, you're about to take all his men. <laughs> what Atari needed was a game to get them started. Bushnell initially wanted a driving game, but he felt that his first engineering recruit, Al Alcorn, should start with something a little bit simpler. As practice, he got him to create a version of a ping pong style game, which had been developed the year before. We wanted it to be something where people already knew the rules, People already knew how to play, and tennis, ping pong was clearly one of those. Ping pong had already been copyrighted, so Bushnell settled for a title taken from the sound made at the moment when the ball hit the paddle. Pong. Nolan had no financial backing, so he used every trick in the book to get Al to make pong as cheap as possible. Nolan asked me to design a video game that he told me he had a contract from General Electric for a home game, which uh, 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 I believed, and described this game with, a, with he described Pong, a spot and a score and paddles and sound. And uh, it had to be very cheap to, uh, uh, to meet the consumer requirements. And, uh, and I went ahead and did that. It never, never occurred to me that nobody from General Electric ever called or came by or wrote a letter, but I was too busy building the darn thing. Fantastic. I recognize this cheeky fella. Yeah. How old is this? Uh, let's see, this is, oh, math question. This is uh, 28 years old. Wow, it looks incredible. Thank you. Does this, I mean, does this one still work? Uh, I think it does, I hope so. Can we have a go on it? Sure, let's plug oh, it in and see what yeah. happens. I'm gonna play Pong with the all man right. who built it. All Brilliant. right, all right. So this is fantastic, I used to play this with my friends at uh, Atari at home. It's, I hope she wasn't that good at it. I'm getting thrashed here. This is incredibly embarrassing. Ah, uh, there you go. You've beaten me again. 
Whose idea was it to have these really simple instructions? Because that's basically it, isn't it? Well, I wrote the instructions, and it was basically Nolan told me that the video game had to have instructions. And I argued with him. I said, if you have to have instructions, then the game's no good. If you have to read the instructions and mm. play the games. But he prevailed. He insisted. So I thought three would be a good number of instructions. So there they are. Deposit quarter. That's step one. We want your money. Yeah. Ball will serve automatically. It's true. Avoid missing ball for high score. That should be my epitaph. I like, <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. Okay, no, you're great, sir. Yeah. Can we have a look in the back of it? Sure, what, sure. in this technological marvel? All right, well, you have a, uh, you have first, you have a, uh, a, a, a wonderful secure back with a key. It looks like it had been pried, tried, pried, pried open at one point, then <laughs> it failed. And, uh, and a bogus serial number that Nolan put on to know that the competition wouldn't know how many we actually built. He started at like 6,000. And uh, VP1 <laughs> to imply we're going to have more. And patent is pending. Uh, it was always pending. Right. We figured we'd scare it. That didn't scare anybody <laughs> away. Man, that is just a TV set. <laughs> yeah, it was a good, low cost, well built Japanese. Still alive after 28 years. I, I bought a consumer TV and a transformer. There's nothing in it. This and is there's room for rent. There's a uh, the computer board is here, the logic board with 76 ICs. And then there's a coin mechanism. Can I just get this out? This is what the money falls into. Sure. Sure. It's a high tech bread pan. It's, it's your just basic. A baking uh, tray. Yeah. I mean, it was cheap and available, and uh, yeah. That is incredible. This is. So the low think... security, but the nice. And I found out later that you're supposed to be able to get the money out from the front. Uh, because that would, when it, it, you have to move the machine out. Right. I didn't know that, but for me it was fun when I was collecting the machines, the people, I didn't want people to see how much money was made because yeah. they might steal it, so I'd give them a free game and I'd be in the back hanging out handfuls Very of quarters. Clever. So that machine must have made $10, and I'd be pulling out $200 of quarters and they'd go, yeah, yeah, probably 10 bucks. You've got Pong a was a global success. It inspired numerous Kevin's copies worldwide. This was the British version. You can move up and down. That's okay. my tennis racket, is right. it? Yes. I have a similar control. Yes. And if you're careful, you can position that. That's wherever you want. You're off. Go on. No, I'm not. I have, missed. Have, have, have 15, another. love. Have another one. You're keeping score, are you? 30, love. Oh, I... Sh Would I you like to serve to me? No, I'm absolutely duff at it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> now, here is where the original Atari started. Oh, really? This is the, the first The actual building. original location here. Let's see. Is this building here? No, 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 no. It's just too nice. Oh, yeah. It's, I was going to say, this it's quite massive. It's not too nice. No, 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 no. 2962 Scott Boulevard. That's it? That's it. That's where we started Atari. It's kind of a small, dingy oh, yeah. little place. Well, once you got going, we busted the wall and moved in next door. <laughs> and uh, then, we, then when we got too big, within like, Four months, we were over in the Martin Boulevard address. Uh huh. Discover Atari. Atari. And discover how far you can go. Atari went pretty far. Starting with handfuls of quarters in Al's bread tin, it went on to become the Microsoft of the 1970s. It expanded massively throughout the decade, and in 1977, Warner Brothers bought Nolan Bushnell out. His initial $250 investment cost them some $30 million. When did Nolan leave Atari? Nolan left Atari uh, after Warner bought us. I think he did it around uh, 79, 79 or 80. So you sold to Warner's. How much money did you get? Well, we sold Atari for, uh, for about, uh, about $30 million. Me personally, I had 10% of the company, but Warner was very clever. They didn't want to give us all the money. We were all, there was nobody in the company over 30 years old. Yeah. And they were, in those days, that was a vast sum of money. Mm. And they thought we would uh, just go off to the beach and never come back. So they doled the money out in little bits oh, to really? us to keep us, uh, because we thought we were, we were so immature. And we did. I was proud of my, our very immaturity. Uh, and so that actually helped because I probably would have put it all the way the first day. The spark of imagination moved on. The next big leap in video games was to come not from here, Silicon Valley, but from a country with a gaming tradition going back hundreds of years. From here, Tokyo, where in 1978, Tomohiro Nishikado wrote a game that would change the way a generation would spend their spare time. In the mid-1970s, arcade goers in Japan were far too busy playing pachinko to be bothered with American video games like Pong, a 
game that seemed to have addicted an entire nation, pachinko involved some ball bearings dropping and you turning a thing, or something like that. In 1978, Pachinko met its nemesis. On Friday, June the 16th, Taito, who previously manufactured Pachinko cabinets and jukeboxes, released Invader, or as more commonly known, Space Invaders. Within six months, Invaders have replaced Pachinko as the country's national pastime. There was even a shortage of the 100 yen coin required to play the game. What the bloody hell's going on? Space Invaders took Japan by storm. It combined the space theme of Western arcade games with a classic plot from Japanese creature feature B-movies. Overnight, Japan came to a standstill, or rather a sit-still. The only time anyone in Tokyo stood up was to hit the dance floor when the cash-in single Disco Invader was playing on the jukebox. Space Invaders was a great balanced game between risk and reward. I mean, in order to shoot the, uh, uh, the aliens, you had to move out behind, from behind the bunkers because they were dropping stuff on you. And so you, it was this constant hit or be hit. I initially got the idea from an American game called Breakout. But why as in Breakout, it was just the player destroying blocks. I wanted to develop a game where the blocks fought back. Invader's success was due to several new ideas which would set the benchmark for all future video games, such as the adoption of the concept of a high score, the idea of progress in destroying successive waves. But perhaps most importantly, Invaders was the first video game to feature fully animated characters. The Invaders seemed real. People could believe they were really saving the Earth. Space Invaders was a worldwide hit. Invaders almost became a victim of its own success, politicians declaring it a menace to Japanese society. Children started staying out all night playing Space Invaders. There was even a case where a girl left home because her parents wanted to stop her playing Invaders. Six months after its release, the police ordered arcade owners to restrict their opening hours and declare the curfew after midnight. Having last played Space Invaders 20 years ago in Slough, I didn't fancy my chances against the man who designed it, especially in a tough away game in Tokyo. Is this your original book that you used when you were designing Space Invaders? The Aha. character, image. Are these, are these the, the original drawings yes. of the aliens? Where did you get the idea for these from? Uh -huh. Some of these look more like, I mean, that looks like a crab, looks like a jellyfish, more like animals you see on this planet as opposed to, to aliens. Was, was that the original case? It would be a great honor if I could have a two player game with you at Space Invaders, would you mind? Uh, 200. Okay. Two players. No, I don't. <laughs> Space Invaders. It's that music. <laughs> dum, 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 dum. <laughs> Rubbish. Yeah, take your jacket off, of course. You mentioned earlier the Nagoya method. What's that? Oh. Oh. Yes, I beat you by 10 points. I actually beat the man who wrote Space Invaders by 10 points. Easy. Easy, wicked skills. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the Goya method, you keep the side ones, you leave them there, and shoot the ones in between. 
You're gonna be in trouble here. The poor mistake that I turn it. Ah, so when they get to the very, very bottom, they can't fire at you. I like it. I like your style. でもこれはね、一番最後が難しいです。ああ。We don't know for sure, but we have estimated that Asteroids easily takes in around $10 million a week in quarters. Asteroids was incredibly tricky to play, had more buttons than any previous game. Five. Only the hard kids could cope with rotate left, rotate right, thrust, fire and hyperspace. It was their names, not mine, that dominated the Hall of Fame at the Montem Sports Center. Asteroids came about because Lyle Raines called me into his office and he said he had an idea for a game where uh, there was a, a previous game, I believe it was called Cosmos, where uh, there was a big indestructible planet and people were always shooting that. And he said, well, why don't you let him shoot uh, you know, something and, and blow it up? And I believe at the time I told him, well, I'd like to blow it into smaller and smaller pieces. Asteroids was a very important game. Um, aesthetically for a start because it used wireframe vector graphics and so it looked very spartan and very sharp and pure. You have to put it on field test. When you put it on field test you take it out to a location and see how much money it makes. Uh, I remember on first field test it, watching some guy come up, put his quarter in and die in like 15 seconds, 20 seconds. You know, it's just, and then he pulled another quarter out. And to me that was a very good sign because usually anybody who dies you know, in 15, 20 seconds it's like, oh man, this game's too hard, I'm, I'm out of here. But this massive game had one massive cheat. It soon became apparent to anyone with an IQ in double figures that if you position your ship at the side of the screen and destroyed all but one of the large, slow-moving asteroids, you could easily pick off the tiny flying saucers for a thousand points each. This technique became so popular it even acquired its own name, lurking. And with an extra life available at every 10,000 points, marathon games ensued. At this machine in Fresno, 18-year-old Greg Davies scored 15 million points, played 31 hours on one quarter. You stood here for 31 hours? No, I sat down. <laughs> I remember at the time I tried lurking. I remember trying it at one point in development and decided, you know, it was too difficult. I'd spent a lot of time at the Montem Sports Center lurking, not on asteroids, but around the girls' changing rooms. Maybe Ed could teach me to do it properly. A quarter in, is it? Nope, not necessary. Oh, have we got three games? Oh, yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Every gamer's dream. Should we have a two-player game? Sure. Lovely. I'll be player one. I'm not very good. Here we go. This is how you play Asteroids. I've got to admit, when I was a kid, I found this game much too hard to play. It was last up 20 seconds. Like I did there. That's embarrassing. Fair play, you are the bloke that wrote it, though, so you should be beating me. <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't guarantee anything. <laughs> Do you think that the fact you can actually put in your initials made it more addictive? Because you felt like you were interacting with it more? Yes. Oops. Got the last rock. Were there any names that you couldn't type in? Like, for example, if, if your name was Frederick Uriah Kennedy, could you put in those initials or...? Actually, um, we started putting sensors in shortly thereafter. Right. Does your wife mind you having this? This is actually her game. Oh, really? She bought this long before she met me. Is that, is that why she fell in love with you? Because you wrote Astro? No. <laughs> I like to think it was because I was a good guy. Right. <laughs> Alongside Asteroids, 1980 saw the introduction of further groundbreaking arcade games. Williams released Defender, written by Eugene Jarvis, which devoured $1.5 billion in quarters during its lifetime. Atari launched Missile Command by Dave Thera, and Battlezone by Ed Rotberg. It really was the high watermark for arcade games in the US. Never again would these American machines be produced in such high numbers. The early 80s also marked the peak in popularity of the American home console. Magnavox's Odyssey had been the world's first in 1972, but it was Atari's Video Computer System, or VCS, that came to sit in every American teenage boy's bedroom, alongside a baseball mitt and a well-thumbed copy of Hustler. In 1980, the sale of these consoles alone made Atari around $250 million. The Japanese, meanwhile, looked elsewhere for inspiration. In the early 1980, Toro Iwatani, a young Namco programmer, found his big idea inside a pizza box. 
The story goes that Toro had been working on Puckman for Namco for a while. It was a maze chase game based on a Japanese nursery rhyme about a small creature that gobbles up all evil things. His main problem was he didn't know what the character should look like, so he thought about it for a few days, and then he went home and ate a pizza. After eating the first slice, he looked down, and staring back up at him was a side-on round head with an open mouth, the perfect shape for his Puckman. Mmm, cold. This was the first time that what you controlled in a video game wasn't simply a spaceship or a blob or a tennis bat. And so it was the beginning of video game character design uh, being able to draw you in to identification with the game. When it came to releasing the game in the US, Midway Manufacturing, the US distributor, were more than happy to introduce it to the States. But they were slightly concerned about the title Puckman. The name was thus changed into the less easy to alter into a rude word title, Pac-Man. It only had one joystick. And there are a lot of people that are so non-ambidextrous, they can't really do things that require two hands. It's non-violent, and it may have been at the right time at the right place. In the US, the game initially received a lukewarm reception, being written off as too cute. On general release, however, it soon attracted an entirely new species to the arcade, a kind which had never been seen before by its usual occupants, girls. Women are insane about this game. Men like the sports games, the action games, and the space games. Women like the Predator games. In those days, most video games were very violent, and the amusement centers were full of boys. So I thought I'd invent a game for girls. I asked myself what a girl's interested in. One word left out, eating. Toro Uatani had created a character. Pac-Man had that magic universal appeal. The result was, at one point, Midway were producing 1,200 machines a day. Pac-Man has become a national phenomenon. I got a callus on my finger and my shoulder's hurting too. The most popular electronic game ever. I'm gonna eat them all up just as soon as it's time. Cause I got Pac-Man fever. Pac-Man fever. It's driving me crazy. It's driving me crazy. I got Pac-Man fever. Pac-Man fever. I'm going out of my mind. Pac-Man, for example. <laughs> I, I don't know about him. Somebody just, I asked about it, and somebody told me that it was a round thing that gobbled up money. I thought that was Tip O'Neill. So we're in the Pac-Man Hall of Fame. Pac-Man's yeah. everywhere. Um, should we have one separate game each? You go first. Do you want to go first? <laughs> ah! <laughs> Fair play, you got 630 points. That's, that's rubbish. That, is, that was rubbish. I, I'm sure I could beat that easily. Here we go. You expect there to be a button there, because it's, it's only one controller you're expecting. Yeah, I can see why girls would like this. It's a little bit tough, isn't it? Mm. One of the important things of Pac-Man, obviously, is the sound. Mm. The waka 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 waka. Where did the sound come from? Yeah, pak pak Waka waka Ah, pak 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 pak. Yeah. How much money did Pac-Man make for Namco? Did it make lots of money? Oh, yeah. Here we go. Right, let's see what that's so six billion yen. That's about sixty million dollars, and that, that was in total. Yes, that's incredible. In one year. In one year. Yes. But what about the UK? What were we doing all this time while the Americans and Japanese were creating classic software? Well, TV games, which were basically Pong under a variety of different names, thrived for a while. But when it came to writing our own software, a few Fred Harris-inspired boffins aside, nothing much was going on. We really didn't seem to be that computer literate. Right, what's this? That's the printer. But that was all set to change, thanks to this man. Clive Sinclair. His dream? A computer in every British home made by Sinclair, hopefully. The spectrum, of course, was always black. Um, but this one was white because it was, the, it was the millionth one made at Dundee. 
Um, indeed, the million month made at all, because they, they made them all in those days. So that was the, the one millionth spectrum ever made. Bought by naive parents to help with your O-levels, all that we actually learnt was how to play games. Our really sad friends even wrote their own. But it was from these fetid teenage bedrooms that the British software industry would finally emerge. The early 1980s saw a home computing boom in the UK. It was led by a generation of acne-ridden, wispy-bearded bedroom programmers, who could even create their own games, because unlike consoles, computers had keyboards. Even if they were as rubbish as the infamous rubber keyboard of the Sinclair Spectrum. The Spectrum was massive because it was the first time there was a really relatively powerful consumer computer that you could buy games for, you could buy magazines and type games in from the magazines. Uh, they never worked, but it was fun for a while. And it encouraged a lot of people to start programming games. And you didn't need a large budget. You could do it in your bedroom all yourself over a couple of months. And some people made a lot of money out of it. Manic Miner was Britain's first software blockbuster. You played Miner Willy, who had to jump his way through 20 screens of platforms collecting treasure, all to a continuous soundtrack, which had previously been thought impossible to do on the Sinclair machine. It also had a very British sense of humour. When you died, a Python-esque foot descended to crush the hapless Miner. As if that weren't daunting enough, there were also mutant jellyfish and flying lavatories to contend with. And here's Matthew Smith. Matthew, how on earth do you come to write a programme like Manic Miner? I do shut myself away for a while to actually get the programme written. Matthew Smith became very wealthy very quickly with the success of Manic Miner and its sequel, Jet Set Willy. But then he disappeared. He stopped writing games and he vanished into video game myth. Uh, for the past few years, there's been a website up called Where Is Matthew Smith? And people have been calling in sightings. According to some rumours, he was planting tulips in Amsterdam. Other people claim to have heard, heard him calling in on radio talk shows or seeing him in, in the local supermarket. I think it's going to get to a stage where one person can't write a whole game. I was 17 when I wrote Manic Mind. From start to finish, uh, from I was in Italy writing, drawing pictures of some levels with some water running down. And I came back and in eight weeks we were duplicating cassettes. I had um, a Tandy TRS-80, but it crashed every time anybody put the kettle on, so I had to work at night. Uh, my favourite monster in Manic Miner, um, I, I got the most compliments on the telephones. There was a game in an Atari written by an American called Bill Hogue. He was uh, very much an inspiration. The game he wrote was Miner 2049er, which was a little man jumping around on platforms, collecting things and avoiding the baddies. <laughs> Sounds like a winner, I like it. All right, Matt, we're here. We've got the Spectrum. Right, well, let's load up Manic Miner, the game that you obviously wrote. Uh, these, I, the Spectrum keys confuse me because it's got the words on there. This is load. Nice symbol shift. I made the first screen fairly hard, just so a stranger to it could enjoy a lot of the frustration without having to get very good at it. It, it, ah. is, it is. A simple mistake like that is enough to end it all. Where did the boot come from that kills you at the end? That all uses, loses your chance? Um, out of the top of the screen. <laughs> well, that's no fair to use. Manic Miner, this is the first game. Jet Set Willy sort of is the sequel to it, isn't it? It's the same character and stuff. How long did that take to... Oh, to that, it was a slog getting Jet Set Willy finished. Were they really pressuring you to come up with, with the, the next big hit? Were you getting people phoning you up saying, come on, now you've yeah, got to do this? Yeah, the assumption was it's once you do one in a certain time, you can keep doing it in the same time. Every Spectrum owner eagerly awaited the final release of the trilogy, the now legendary Minor Willy Meets the Tax Man. Wasn't there supposed to be a third one, Jet Set Willy Meets the Tax Man or something? Uh, yeah. Well, what happened to that? Is that... Uh, the Tax Man was way at the back of the queue there. Oh, really? <laughs> Well, that being rude, how much did you make from Manic Miner? I did have a substantial sum, but I expected a whole lot more, mm. so I spent what I had did fairly you, foolishly. You are the stuff of legend. You are a legend. There's no doubt about it. In this sort of world, you are. Can I run past some rumours that are on the net about you, and you can just say, tell us if it's true or if it's false? Um, you lived in Holland in a commune. This is, yeah, 
When did that happen? That was a great time. Uh, I went there in 1995. Okay, you worked as a fish seller. Uh, mm, no, I don't think I ever sold fish. I tried to get a job in a fish gutting factory. <laughs> uh, but I applied at the wrong time of year. What does it feel like to, like to know there are you know, sort of a lot of people interested in what you're doing now, 20, you know, 20 years after you wrote this? Well, everything comes around and goes around. Uh, like five years after I did it, I was a washout. And uh, 10 years after I did it, I was history. But it's 20, coming up to 20 years now, and I'm a legend. <laughs> Once invincible Atari has lost 200 million pounds so far this year and sacked one in three workers. Suddenly, in 1983, the American video game industry hit a brick wall. Not since 1929 has an industry fallen so far, so fast. In this neighborhood in Florida, the Chuck E. Cheese video arcade closed down. Supercade Amusements closed down. And where the Space Odyssey video arcade once stood, Dollhouse 3, a strip joint. Arcades weren't the only ones in trouble. The console market also collapsed. Powerful home computers made machines like Atari's eight-year-old VCS seem prehistoric. On top of this, a glut of terrible games seemed to make it game over for home consoles. But a small Japanese novelty toy maker had other ideas. Nintendo Copy was founded in 1889 in the ancient imperial capital of Kyoto. For over 80 years, it produced traditional Hanafuda playing cards. But in the 1960s, it diversified into the novelty toy market. Board games, beam guns, and love testers. In 1974, Nintendo produced its first video game, an electronic version of the traditional Japanese game, Go. But it was in the home console market that Nintendo was to have the biggest impact. The language of a generation changed as Nintendo firmly replaced Atari in the American vocabulary. It was here in Kyoto at the Nintendo headquarters, which is um, that building just over there, in 1985 that Shigeru Miyamoto saved the video game industry. Hello! It's me, Mario! People warm to Mario because he's the antithesis of the superhero. He's not big and strong and muscular and blonde hair and blue eyed. He's a short, dumpy Italian fellow with a moustache and a big nose. Mario is the video game superstar. A survey in the United States in 1989 found that more American children recognize Mario than Mickey Mouse. Mario is far better known than his creator, Shigeru Miyamoto. That is, except in the world of video games, where this former cartoonist is probably even more popular than Jesus. Miyamoto may be the John Lennon of video games because he brought soul to games. Everyone looks at the next Miyamoto game to find out, you know, what new things the man has invented. UNT I first no, joined Okinawa. Nintendo because I heard they design equipment for children's playgrounds, and that's what I was interested in doing. He started off at Nintendo doing graphics, doing packaging, things like that. Uh, but he also was an obsessed game player. In 1981, Radar Scope, Nintendo's latest US release, failed. Nintendo was left with a lot of unsold cabinets on its hands. In desperation, they turned to Miyamoto to create a new game that would work in them. The result was Donkey Kong. I wanted to create a comedy gorilla character, not a frightening one. And so I called the game Donkey Kong, because I heard that in English, donkey means <laughs> foolish. I checked with the people who were in charge of English at Nintendo. They said that it was fine. But when the game was launched in the United States, everyone over there thought it was a very weird name. <laughs> It was the gorilla's owner who stole the show. Originally called Jumpman, he was renamed after the landlord of Nintendo's American warehouse, Mario Sigali. Mario's famous features were forced on his creator by the limited graphics of the time. Mario wears a hat because I couldn't make his hair move realistically. He's got a moustache to hide his mouth because I couldn't draw the mouth properly. 
Mario's red overalls and blue shirt help you see the movement of his arms. It wouldn't be as clear if his top was all one color like my jacket. He's taking a picture. Hang on a second, he's filming someone, of course. <laughs> Very good. OK, you, you be Mario, I'll be Luigi. Here we go. Oh. I haven't played this for a while, so I might not be very good. Get out of it! Oh. <laughs> you fell for that old chestnut. When was when was the last time you played this? Do you play this very often? これ。どうじゃ、もうそろそろ彼これ10年ぐらいは遊んでないですよ。Well, <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> well, it, that doesn't show because you're doing terribly, it's got to be said. Money. Name? Hang on a second. Look at that. Mario, which is you, <laughs> game over. Luigi's still playing there. I think that, that says quite a lot. Yeah. And you invented this Two game. Thousand. You invented this mm. game. <laughs> Nintendo, however, wasn't going to rest on its laurels. Handheld video games have been around since the time of Game & Watch, Nintendo's first foray into the world of home video games in the early 80s. But in 1989, Nintendo launched Game Boy, the video game equivalent of a Walkman, and designed for adults as well as children. To launch this revolutionary range, Nintendo needed a killer app, a killer application, a game so good people would buy the machine just to play the game. Their killer app eventually came from behind the Iron Curtain, the work of an obscure Russian computer programmer. Its odd-sounding name was Tetris. I started working in, in computers as a specialist in artificial art intelligence. But the game was always kind of the place where, uh, where my heart was. I love all kind of puzzles, maybe not the game, but the puzzles. And that, uh, that was the <laughs> that was I'm very interested in. Tetris is a game of brilliant, elegant simplicity, yet no one had thought of it before because I've been too busy incinerating aliens. Tetris, by contrast, was a truly Soviet game. Stark, functional, and an ultimately doomed attempt to make order out of chaos, but without the trip to Siberia if you lose. I think Tetris has this idea of cleaning things up, pushed to a high art. This is one where tidiness is, is, is next to godliness. It is brilliant and addictive, and it is uh, everything that a video game should be. You start to play, and you can't stop. When the first kind of moving version of the program appears, I, I can't stop, I can't finish my programming because I pretend I kind of testing it, but I keep playing and playing and playing. Because he wrote Tetris in the Soviet Union, Alexei didn't own the copyright to the game. Every Russian did, in theory. When the Soviet government sold the game to Nintendo in 1989, they made an estimated five million dollars. Alexei made an estimated nothing. With the fall of communism, he moved to the US, where he now works for a Seattle-based computer company. Tetris was inspired by a puzzle Alexei found in the Moscow toy shop. This box is about 20 years old. <laughs> really? What was this game yeah, called? Yeah, it's called Pentomino. Pentominoes, right? Yeah, and th this, is a, uh, th th this is a box with all different uh, oh, these, yeah. shapes which you could do out of five squares. If oh, you... five squares, because Tetris, of course, yeah, is the four squares, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. And what's the idea of Pentominoes? So, so the idea is, oh, please put it back. <laughs> All right, it will easily, of course. Yeah, sure. And uh, basically, usually it takes about an hour for... An hour? Yeah. Well... So, so you, could, uh, you could put most of them here, but... <laughs> but I think I'd but the it. rest, uh, but the last three or four pieces would be a problem. Well, you know? they, they may be a problem for you, Alexi, <laughs> but I'm sure there won't be a problem here at all. Hang on a second, that goes yeah. in there. This is... A little bit trickier than I thought, but I think I can do it. I thought that if you if you finish the line, if you make yeah. complete the line, complete it, the line it is no reason to keep it on the screen anymore. So it's right, start to take it away. And Fantastic. That's, and so that's that, how that risk came out. So it's infinite, out. so that means it can keep on going forever and ever. Yeah. In England, I don't know if you know, there was, a, there was a version of Tetris called Sextris. Have you heard that? It was, it was naked men and women falling Ah, yes, down. I've seen Have this. Have you seen uh, that? I've seen this And if version, they fall yes. into the right position, they... 
gently yeah. make love. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think I don't think it adds too much no. to, to, the, to, <laughs> to the game. I think your version was slightly better. I've got to say. <laughs> Why is Tetris so addictive? It's the most simple game. Why is it so addictive? <laughs> I I've heard uh, many many explanations of the of this phenomena. And a friend of mine who who is a psychologist, he said to me that. It is something we should notice about the Tetris. What you see on the screen when you play, mm. this is just a picture of your mistakes. All your destination, all your results are some way in this number and mm. score. But, but what cries from the screen is your mistakes and you want to fix it right away. Yeah. The 1990s saw great technological leaps in gaming. Perhaps most significant was the entrance of an electronics giant who'd shown no intention of developing video game systems before. Sony and their all-conquering PlayStation. The PlayStation became the console that made video games cool. They were installed in nightclubs across the UK, and games like Wipeout had soundtracks written by cutting-edge dance acts like the Chemical Brothers and Aphex Twin. But more importantly, it introduced the world to its first real female video game superstar, Lara Croft. I started Tomb Raider when I was 23. I thought it would be great to have a game, because at the time the only thing that was out um, um, in the way of 3D was things like Doom and, and Ultima Underworld. And I thought a game that had those sorts of first person corridor style stuff going on, mixed with the Virtua Fighter sort of characters that had only just sort of started coming out at that time. And then if you put that all together, then you could sort of try and direct it, like almost like a cinematic thing and that would make for a really, really impressive game, I thought. So that was the whole idea of Tomb Raider. By the 1990s, games had become too complex to be written by lonely individuals. Toby Gard led a huge team of graphic artists, programmers and musicians to create Tomb Raider. Games now possess the ambition and budget of cinema, and they deserve to. In Lara Croft, Toby created as big a sex symbol as anything Hollywood has to offer. She exudes a certain kind of blank desirability the reason why she's so attractive is that she looks like no woman in particular. The Lara phenomenon shows how video games have matured along with the people who play them. People like me, who as kids played Pac-Man or Manic Miner, are now in their 20s and 30s and still playing games. We've grown up and so have the games we play. Plot lines and characters have developed to emotionally involve the player. Graphics are becoming picture perfect, increasingly adult themes are being incorporated, and even your girlfriend isn't averse to spending an evening in with you and Lara Croft. If you look at the case with cinema, for 30 or 40 years, cinema was thought to be a mindless form which was just sensationalist and pornographic. Um, and eventually people realised, well, there are artistic things you can do with cinema that you can't do with any other forms. And I think the same is true with video games. Video games have come a long way since Steve Russell's desire to fill MIT coffee breaks with something just a little bit more interesting than crosswords. Video games will sort of converge on reality. I mean, we'll be so totally immersed that we won't tell, be able to tell that there's a separate me from the environment that I'm in. If as they become more and more realistic, they really will be able to offer an alternative existence, then maybe for the first time in 2,000 years, we can all look forward to life in a better place with absolute confidence. Shame on you if you missed Alec McBeal, Friends or ER this week. Still, E4 will let you off if you catch up on Second Chance Sunday, tomorrow from 8. Stay with us as you're invited to a seriously good party on The Real Beach, next. <laughs>